last week. Uh, a predecessor of Evelyn Underhill's was Brooke Foss Westcott, uh, who had been professor at Cambridge University, uh, dean of Westminster in London, and then later a Bishop of Durham, uh, where he both wrote a splendid commentary on Hebrews and came to the support of the first miners' strike in England. Quite an interesting bishop. And uh, he was not, however, known for the crystal clarity of his writing. In fact, some people found it something that obfuscated what he was trying to say. So the story goes that when he was in London, there was a particularly dense fog, and there were two men walking along the street, and they said, I wonder why the fog is so dense. And one suggested, perhaps Dean Westcott has left his study window open. We discussed last week the work of Evelyn Underhill, and I'd like to begin where we left off at the base of page one with her understanding of the phases of the mystical life, proceeding from a sense of the awakening to transcendence, and then closely allied with that an awareness of one's own limited capacity to understand what lies beyond us. This leads in her analysis on page two to the stage of purgation and illumination by which Evelyn Underhill meant that one could undertake by means of discipline to better understand how it is one is limited and to use limitation itself as a doorway in order to understand the transcendent. This leads, in her analysis, to that illumination that she refers to under phase three. But then comes the moment that she always thought was necessary, not merely possible, namely the dark night of the soul, when one has a feeling of being entirely bereft of that very sense of God with which one began, as if the moment of awareness comes that even one's discipline is broken. And that, she believed, was a necessary prelude to the final aim of the entire sequence, namely number five, a sense of union with God, a constant presence of the Holy Spirit, as Evelyn Underhill also expressed it. I pointed out last time that Underhill came under criticism from her own contemporaries because it seemed to many of them that she was in effect not talking about the worship of Christ, she was talking more about the individual becoming Christ. And that, at the end of the day, was something she recognized was a fair criticism. She believed that was exactly the purpose of Christianity. In the words that we frequently heard repeated during the classic period of Christianity, man became God in order that God might be revealed in man. It wasn't for the purpose of separating people from God, but rather of bringing humanity to the realization that its identity actually lies in God. The most interesting argument she got into over this precise issue was with Friedrich von Hugel, who was also her spiritual advisor. It was typical of Evelyn Underhill that she put herself in the care of one of her critics. And Van Hugel always wanted Underhill to change the way in which she expressed the development of the mystical life and to be more Christocentric, uh, not to put so much stock in the work of Sufi mystics or of Jewish mystics, but Evelyn, being Evelyn, listened carefully and then did 
precisely what she had been doing all of her life. Another way in which she turned out to be a contrarian was that during the First World War, along with many, many others, of course, in England, she joined the effort uh, in the quest for victory, but she came so despondent about the consequences not only of the war, but of the peace, that as the storm clouds were gathering for the Second World War, she became a prominent leader in the Anglican pacifist movement, a movement which you might imagine was not exactly popular when war actually broke out. So in 1941, when she died, Underhill was under criticism for, in effect, not being sufficiently Christian, not being sufficiently Christocentric, and also for not being sufficiently patriotic in that she had established her credentials as a pacifist. But even as that happened, with the publication of her work on mysticism, and then with a second work called Worship, Evelyn Underhill was establishing a different way of looking at the practice of Christianity, which I've put in that second box on the second page. It offered the prospect of seeing Christianity unfold according to a different system, using the same definition of system that we've deployed all the way through these sessions. First, and quite obviously, when we look to the meaning of the activity of all forms of religious belief and practice, we see that union with God lies as the central philosophical purpose. But then ritual also changes in its orientation. Ritual is now set up for the purpose of contemplation. Whether that ritual is entirely private or corporate, its aim is to bring about the soul's greater awareness of God. Whether it is God in the infinite capacity of transcendence or the ways in which we recognize ourselves as limited in reference to God, the purpose of ritual on this understanding is precisely to provide a discipline of contemplation for the individual and for the community. And then finally, the element which is distinctively Christian within Underhill's take is that the ethics she insists upon are precisely the love exemplified by Christ. This is what turned her into a pacifist during the course of the first half of the 20th century. Incidentally, for those of you who've been following me up in what we've been doing here by means of the book Christianity, The Basics, this takes us to the end of that book. And what I'm doing now, once I've described Underhill's work, is to explain how it is that after her death, two major discoveries gave a kind of substance to her approach which could not have been predicted in 1941. And the reason that these discoveries could not have been predicted is that they happened by accident, the way truly good discoveries should happen. One happened in 1945, near to a very small village in Egypt called Nag Hammadi. And at Nag Hammadi, there was, depending on who you believe, uh, an effort of someone to escape the consequences of a crime or someone digging for fertilizer. In any case, one of these two motives was causing a person to enter a cave, and in the cave, there were found jars that had been sealed. 
those sealed jars turned out to be a complete library from the fourth century of the Common Era, including works which had been referred to by historical figures in antiquity, but of which we had no copies whatever until the work of deciphering began, and including other works of which we had no knowledge whatsoever. This has been the basis on which it has been possible now to describe what Gnosticism is on the basis of actual Gnostic sources, not on the basis of hearsay. The other discovery happened exactly one year later in 1946, not in Egypt, but rather in what was then Palestine, near to the Dead Sea. And there someone got into a cave, either because he was escaping the law or because he was digging for fertilizer. Does this sound familiar? Believe it or not, there are entire literatures associated with the two finds, which have a fertilizer clan and also the escaping the law clan. It's quite remarkable. But the Bedouin, in the case of the discovery near to Qumran, as that small settlement was called, also discovered jars that had originally been sealed and complete copies of scrolls in Hebrew, in Aramaic, and also in Greek. These are often referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Qumran Scrolls because they're so near. But the fact is that after the discovery in those caves, other caves in the Judean wilderness greatly expanded the number of manuscripts that we now have available. Although the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls occurred second, I'm going to deal with it first today because it reflects a period of time which is earlier from the point of view of the manuscripts. The Gnostic documents, as I said, were written in the fourth century of the Common Era. There are clearly materials at Qumran which come from the third century before the Common Era and which clearly represent the state of Judaism in the first century in a way that causes us completely to reevaluate what the practice of Judaism was. One reason for which this find at Qumran is so important is that the documents there are not limited to what happened to be used by that one sectarian group only about 30% of the manuscripts relate to the practice of the group known as the Essenes. The rest are a combination of biblical works, manuscripts which gave us the earliest known textual testimony to say the book of Isaiah, and in addition, other works not biblical but widely read by Jews in the first century. For example, the book of Enoch, as I referred to uh, towards the second half of page two. That work tells us about what really happened to Enoch. You might have thought the story ended very soon because the book of Genesis says, Enoch walked with God and he was not. Not. And he was not. He what? Died. Disappeared. Went someplace else. The argument of the book of Enoch is he went someplace else. He went on a heavenly journey. He was shown the secrets of the stars and the universe, the relationship of the angels of the angelic court to scientific knowledge on earth. 
he was shown why the event of Noah's flood happened, what its significance was. And most importantly, he was brought in to the very throne of God where God also gave him a commission so that he would be able to embody the wisdom that was related to him. This central focus on the throne of God, on divine presence, is of course something that we can also see within the biblical tradition. But the book of Enoch shows us unmistakably two elements that had not been fully grasped prior to the time that the book of Enoch was discovered at Qumran. First, the picture of God on a throne is not merely a picture. It involves an experience, an experience that transforms the person who is involved and who then takes on a divine commission. And second, this experience of being transformed and commissioned is not something which can in any way be restricted to the book of Enoch. Because when that is seen in terms of experience, one goes back to the Hebrew Bible and reads it with new eyes. Moses, in Exodus chapter 24, we are told, saw God, ate and drank in his presence, and then only thereafter was given the Torah. In the book of Exodus, Moses is first a mystic and second a lawgiver. In a later document to which I refer on page three, a classic representation, namely the book of Ezekiel from the sixth century of the Common Era, the prophet describes himself as being by the river Kibar in Babylon. We might know that better today as Baghdad. One of the exiles of Judea, who there says that he had a direct experience of the throne of God that commissioned him to explain how the exiles were going to return to Jerusalem and rededicate a temple there. How Ezekiel could experience the throne of God, which had been associated with the temple, is explained by the prophet himself, who says the throne of God is in the nature of a mirkabah, of a chariot. The presence of God can move. It can be wherever it was, any time, any place. What we discover from Enoch is that the experience of God is actually embedded in prophetic literature and that this literature builds up over time. That is, when you read Ezekiel, you can see ways in which earlier texts, Exodus, but also Isaiah, are, are involved. When you later read the book of Daniel from the second century before the Common Era, you can see the influence of Ezekiel. And then in Enoch, you can see how this tradition was taken on. And interestingly, the geography of the book of Enoch shows that it tells you how this tradition was taken on in Galilee. Although the manuscript is found in Judea, the geography it refers to is specifically Galilean. In fact, the same mountain that features in the story of Jesus' transfiguration also features in the book of Enoch. When traditions develop in this way, one after another, it is because practitioners are actively grasping what went on before them, 
making it their own, and then developing it in their own way. As I say towards the bottom of page three, the term Kabbalah comes from this process. Uh, to Kabbal in Aramaic means to grasp, to hold on to, and was used especially when a student wished personally to hold on to the tradition of his teacher. The noun Kabbalah means this whole process of holding on to the earlier tradition. And I point out in that box that there are many cases in the New Testament where you can see that vital figures, including Paul and Jesus, are said to be involved in that process. Now, of course, the noun Kabbalah is also sometimes used of a later literature that developed during the Middle Ages, especially in Jewish circles. But that later literature developed because there had been a long Kabbalah, a long chain of tradition from the Hebrew Bible, and indeed from before that time, and all the way through antiquity and until the Middle Ages. Now, as I point out on page four in the box on John the Baptist, this becomes especially interesting to us as we apply this insight to the case of Jesus, because Jesus' own rabbi, namely John the Baptist, when we place him in the context of the Judaism of his time, appears to have a strong connection precisely to this kind of tradition. We think of John the Baptist, quite understandably, because this is the way the Gospels see him. We think of John the Baptist as coming in order to predict the coming of Jesus. But what does John the Baptist actually say in his own terms, in his own words? What he says is, I immerse you in water, but the one who comes after me, he himself will immerse you in Holy Spirit. Who immerses in Holy Spirit? John the Baptist is actually referring to the coming of God, to the way in which God is going to purify his people in advance of judgment. And that's the reason for which John took up his own particular program of purification so that Israel would be ready to accept that gift of spirit when it came. That's just the way John is described by another contemporary of his, namely Josephus. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, doesn't say John the Baptist came into the wilderness because he wanted to predict the coming of Jesus. Jesus is not an important figure for Josephus. After all, he came from Galilee. It wouldn't make Josephus radar. Uh, Josephus is interested in Judea, in major figures there. Uh, as a result, he says more about John the Baptist and more about James, the brother of Jesus, than he says about Jesus himself. Very interesting historian, Josephus. And one of the ways he's instructive is that he shows us how Jewish opinion would respond to John the Baptist simply as a figure of purification who promises the coming of spirit. Now just this also instantiates one of the prophecies of Ezekiel, that central prophet of the Mirkabah. And so in Ezekiel 36, this is over on page five, we read, therefore say to the house of Israel, so says the Lord, the Lord, not for your sake am I acting, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the peoples you came to. I will sanctify my great name, although profaned among the peoples among whom you have profaned it, and the peoples will know 
that I am the Lord, says the Lord, the Lord when I am sanctified among you before their eyes. I will take you from the peoples and gather you from the lands and bring you to your land. I will sprinkle on you clean waters and cleanse you from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in your midst. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. My spirit I shall put in your midst and I will make you walk according to my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. The pairing of being cleansed by water and having the spirit in one's midst is precisely what Ezekiel insists upon and what John the Baptist then puts into practice. We can see that there is a form of Judaism that had for a long time been largely concealed from us. Concealed from us, why? Well, because from the Christian side, there was an assumption that everything Jewish was there in order to be transcended. That everything Jewish was there in order to show the road not taken, which was to be revealed in Christianity. But then this kind of Judaism was also concealed because Judaism itself had been rooted in the identity of Moses as lawgiver instead of the identity of Moses as one who is inspired by the Spirit and who gives the Spirit. We were discovering by means of Qumran that there was a new form of Judaism which was also an ancient form of Judaism and it had features which were reminiscent of precisely what Evelyn Underhill was talking about. As a consequence, you began to see shifts in research in both Judaism and Christianity. On the Jewish side, Gershom Sholem came into the 20th century having read Evelyn Underhill quite carefully and then being influenced by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. On the Christian side, Albert Schweitzer came into the 20th century reading Evelyn Underhill and applying it more to Paul than to Jesus, largely because Nag Hammadi had not yet been discovered. So he had to look at someone who obviously had some form of historical background and so Schweitzer turned normally to Paul and less to Jesus. But now we're in a different time. The Dead Sea Scrolls are there. And as we'll see next week, there's also the entire discovery at Nag Hammadi to be considered, which also shows us something new about the philosophy about, of the time, about classical religions, and about the intersection of Judaism and Christianity. It begins to look as if the future of Christianity might well have a future, and it's because it has a past. Thank you very much indeed. Faith Campo has an enthusiastic question, so we'll go to Faith first. Oh, okay. Albert Schweitzer, I was just talking earlier with uh, Barbara Lindsley about this. Our, we mostly know Albert Schweitzer, if we don't know him as a doctor, uh, as a scholar of Jesus. But you know, he was only a doctor because he was a scholar of Jesus. Uh, after Albert Schweitzer wrote his book on Jesus, he applied to a missionary organization so that he can go to Africa and bring Christian faith to the missionaries. The missionary organization said to him, not on your life. We are not sending you as a missionary because you're a radical scholar and we don't want you going and preaching what you wrote about Jesus to anyone. So 
being Albert Schweitzer, he said, all right, I'll qualify as a medical doctor. And he did. He went away, got himself another degree to add to his degrees in theology and music, and qualified as a medical doctor, applied to the same missionary organization. And they said, all right. <laughs> you can, in fact, go to Africa on the condition you do not preach. And he accepted and went. And then after about 20 years, he forgot about the preaching part, started doing it. But while he was there, while he was in Africa, influenced by the practice of African religion around him, and also reading for himself in the growing awareness of what Greco-Roman religion was like during the first century, he wrote a life of St. Paul, which in my opinion is actually much better than his book on Jesus. The book on Jesus is actually a book about Jesus' scholarship. It's a review of the literature from the 18th century until the end of the 19th century with a critical analysis. I mean, it's fine for a PhD thesis, but it's really not very interesting. The book on Paul, on the other hand, is dealing with the question of what is the center of Paul's religious personality? And Schweitzer comes to the view that it involves Paul's sense of what it means to be in union with Christ. Clearly, he was a reader of Evelyn Underhill's. And so that was, that was the distinction that I was making about Albert Schweitzer. Another author worthwhile reading and a lot easier to read Oh, incidentally, a late breaking story. Al Alstrom has discovered he did not read up to page 50 in Evelyn Underhill's book, Worship. Uh, he read up to page 71. So never let it be said <laughs> that he did, not, he did not break page 50. Uh, that Albert Schweitzer was easier to read than Evelyn Underhill. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think actually Schweitzer, it, it shows you something in, interesting about prose at the beginning of the 20th century, that in many ways German is easier to read than English of that period. I mean, the English language went through a very interesting literary phase during the Victorian period. Another book. Yeah, I meant that Schweitzer is easier to read. Yeah. That's right. I wish I could suggest someone else on mysticism other than Underhill, but all attempts to simplify result in a kind of loss of her analytic ability. Maybe she really had to write that way. It's, it's quite possible. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, question relates to how in Underhill's scheme, if you turn over to page two, uh, ritual relates to contemplation and therefore feeds out into the other parts of the system. Uh, it seems to me that one of the strengths of what Underhill does is that the link between ritual and the two other elements of the system is transparent. Uh, there are cases when, in the study of a, of a religion, ritual is or is made to seem 
uh, something which lies on top of belief and ethical practice. Whereas in Underhill's analysis, because ritual is designed as a form of contemplation, that will lead along two lines quite naturally. Uh, and when she refers to this, uh, she is most of all thinking of the Christian practice of Eucharist. Uh, that's why her book, Worship, really is focused on precisely that issue. And in her consideration, what that means is by celebrating the Eucharist, two things happen to the believer, and these two things are related. Uh, the one is the more external, but being uh, put in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist causes the believer better to understand the love of Christ and therefore to put that into practice. So as she sees it, there is a direct link from ritual to ethics that follows quite naturally. But the other link, the internal link, is also quite natural since what is celebrated in the Eucharist all the way through is precisely Christ's identity in God. So that the believer also, by experiencing the presence of Christ, is also linked to God. Uh, I take this to be one of the major strengths of her approach to Christianity. Now, when she deals with other forms of ritual, uh, bear in mind that she, she is uh, pre-Krumran and pre nag Hammadi, And therefore, she has to take all of her examples as they are available to her in the scholarship of the time. Uh, I regard it as being notable in itself that she decided to move out of her own tradition to see how this kind of approach to God would work, say, in Sufism, of which she gives many examples, and then also in Jewish mysticism. And uh, what she comes to there is the sense that within Sufi practice, you have not only the study of texts, but also the meet, meeting together and above all dance uh, in order to find that place where one's consciousness can be pure for contemplation. And then on the Judaic side, she also has available to her many late Kabbalistic texts, but texts which nonetheless insist on the way in which the sage of the Kabbalah comes into a position in relation to God very much like one of the prophets. So that she began to lay the basis of a form of comparative mysticism such that you could see how it would work, yes, within Christianity, but would not be limited to Christianity because then you could compare it to other forms. Uh, that was extremely helpful in the period after Underhill because now it's apparent to us as a result of discoveries at Qumran that Jewish mysticism existed fully developed prior to Christianity. So we can hardly say that it's a Christian approach which we can then apply to Judaism. It was already there and embedded. And the other feature of all the Judean scrolls, which is notable in this regard, uh, is the number of times that we find texts, uh, many of them very fragmentary, but readable, that make it very clear to us that people in different kinds of communities were using the book of Ezekiel using books which are not presently in her Bible, but which nonetheless speak of the throne of God, in order to refer to the way in which the practitioner of Judaism was directly related to the divine. 
I don't mean to suggest that this was the only form of Judaism available in the first century. There were other forms. They were definitely Pharisees in the first century. There were priests. There were Sadducees. There were scribes. There were philosophical practitioners of Judaism, such as Philo of Alexandria. But in that mix, there were also mystical practitioners of Judaism. This we know on the basis of literary sources, and we did not know that prior to the discovery of the Qumran scrolls. Yes, please. Cantor Bob asked me about the relationship between the experience of the throne of God and what we would call an out-of-body experience. Let me give you some textual references which could help us on this and then reflect on their meaning for, for this question. When Paul is writing to the congregations in Corinth, he at one point loses his temper, more than usual. <laughs> and because it was more than usual, uh, he also speaks of matters which he, generally speaking, refused to. This was not a side that he wanted to be a matter of public debate, generally speaking. But it happened in the course of his correspondence that his identity as an apostle was challenged. And so he explained where that identity came from. And so he says, I know a man in Christ, that would be me, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was taken up into the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know but God knows. And such a man was told things which it is not appropriate for him to speak. So in that case, we have Paul referring to his experience of being in the divine presence as being one in which whether he is in or out of his body, he actually can't say. And another text related to this uh, occurs in the Gospel according to Mark, where Jesus is in the process of his activity as an exorcist. People with him go out of the house where he had been staying. He's outside the house himself. They go out of the house and they're described as grabbing him, stopping him because they say, in the Greek text of Mark, ex est, he is beside himself. That exact expression corresponds to the Aramaic description, behutz, beside oneself. And when someone in rabbinic literature is in the moment there's a story where a rabbi is walking and someone says hello. And the rabbi completely ignores the other person. And the other person says, well, what is going on? Why well, didn't say hello? Don't worry, he's behutz. Which doesn't mean he's a tenured professor. It means, <laughs> it means no, you know, he in his mind is somewhere else. He is beside himself. So the idea that when a person has an experience of that reality, 
of the transcendent is that it can be so vivid that the person's limitation is at least for the duration of that experience dissolved. And, and that's why the question of in the body or out of the body does emerge. Uh, but it's also why I think Paul is very wise to say, I don't really know which is the case. Because the point is the entire concentration on that other reality. But nice, nice question indeed. Yes, please. The cardinal has a question, so. Oh, question of who is of Underhill stature. I really think no one, when you look at her ability to bring together historical sources and an, an analysis of the experience itself, uh, today the tendency is for the literature to be either about the history or about the experience. Now, on the historical side, there are many good authors. I referred to Gershom Sholem earlier on, but we had one of Sholem's followers here just a couple of years ago, Itamar Grunwald from the University of Tel Aviv. And he has shown the importance of mysticism within Judaism. Uh, another person uh, closer to home uh, who does that same thing is uh, Elliot Wilson at New York University, especially good as an uh, exegete of Talmudic materials. Uh, on the Christian side, I referred to Albert Schweitzer. I think that he remains a very important figure on the Pauline side and what it opens up. And then the attempt to take what Schweitzer was saying about Paul and to observe wait a moment, that occurred because it was already happening in Jesus, a connection Schweitzer didn't make. That connection has been made by Marcus Borg on the uh, West Coast and by me on the East Coast. Uh, Marcus and I make a career out of disagreeing with one another, but the fact is that we're applying the same understanding, namely Evelyn Underhill's, to the historical comprehension of Jesus. But then, sadly, I have to say that I think that uh, the practitioner side of the literature of mysticism has tended to take off from any interest in history, which I think is a pity. I mean, I understand why it can happen, because when one is concerned with such an experience, you might well think, well, why should I be concerned with anything as passing as historical data. Certainly there's something more important than data going on. I mean, even Nag Hammadi and Qumran, we only found it because people were either digging manure or escaping the law. How really important can it possibly be? And my response is really very important because you can't develop the patterns that Underhill was talking about without a patient investigation of actual people and their experiences. Uh, having said that, I would also point out that there's been an unfortunate tendency. I'm just, in fact, investigating this with a class I'm teaching uh, this semester. It's something I found out quite by accident. Last semester, I taught a course on mysticism, and of course we used Evelyn Underhill, but also a series of other sources. And one that I did not use was a very prominent work by Carolyn Walker Bynum called Holy Feast, Holy Fast. And so I thought, I'm teaching a course on theories of religion. It would be a lot of fun to teach that around the issues of feasting and fasting. Students will understand at least one half of those from the beginning. Uh, and so why don't we read Carolyn Walker Bynum? 
And I reread her and came to a realization that had escaped me on the first reading of Bynum. She never talks about Evelyn Underhill. It's a, how can you write a book on medieval mystics? I mean, the least you can do is trash her. <laughs> There's not a reference to her. There's such a sense that if you do scientific study of religion, uh, you will not be interested in the side of experience. I think that's a bad mistake. And it's one of my purposes to see to it that our discussion of experience is informed by history, but also when we do history, we understand that it's a history that involves experience. So I thank you for coming. Cardinal is giving me that signal, which makes me want to move before he gives me the other signal. <laughs> thank you for coming.